Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to join you for the IPS 35th Anniversary Conference and to discuss the topic of revisiting our social compact. And the social compact sets out our shared understanding of how everyone in society relates to one another. It's about the roles and responsibilities of different groups, be it government, employers, community, or individuals. So today, I'd like to highlight the importance of having a compact that is deemed fair by all segments of society, why that is needed to hold our country together, and what we must do to achieve this. I think we can start by looking at the experiences of other countries and what everyone is grappling with. All governments understand what happens when their citizens are excluded from the country's progress. People lose faith in each other, and the result is more fractured societies. In particular, the advanced Western economies have faced more challenges over the recent decades of globalization. They have seen their industrial bases being hollowed out and median incomes stagnating. And that's why you see now countries in the US and Europe shifting towards more domestic and worker-centric approaches in their policies. America, for example, talks about buying American and a foreign policy for the middle class. But even in China, where, which has benefited significantly from globalization, the focus is on common prosperity. So what about Singapore? Uh, we've always worked hard to ensure that everyone can share in the benefits of our country's progress. Amongst the advanced economies, we are one of the few where people in the middle have enjoyed significant increases in real incomes over the last 20 years. In particular, median household real income growth over the past decade was higher than what the middle income in the US and most other European societies experienced and well above other Asian societies like Japan and Hong Kong. Meanwhile, our income inequality, as measured by the Gini coefficient, has been steadily declining as a result of deliberate policy moves like workfare and the progressive wage model. So, on the whole, at least based on some of these macro indicators, we have been doing well, but we certainly should not rest on our laurels. We are in a more dangerous and troubled external environment, we face rapid technological changes that will bring about more disruptive impact for workers. And domestically, we also have to deal with societal trends with long-term consequences, including a rapidly aging population, concerns that social mobility, while still strong relative to other countries, is starting to slow down, as well as greater anxieties and stresses felt by different groups all across society. And that's why we've embarked on the Forward Singapore exercise to update our social compact for our next bound of development. We've engaged many Singaporeans over the past year, and through these conversations, there is an emerging consensus on what our refreshed compact could look like. It's centered around several key shifts, and I'll highlight three today a new approach to success and skills, a revamped system of social support, and a renewed sense of social solidarity. So let me start with the new approach to success. What is this good life that we aspire towards? And what does the Singapore story mean to all of us? In the past, people talked about the five Cs, cash, car, credit card, condominium, and country club memberships. Nowadays, we've moved on from the five Cs. Very few people talk about that. But as a society, we still tend to converge around certain material definitions of success, the size of the paycheck, the property we own, or the prestige of a brand name school. To be clear, everyone is concerned about the basics in life. We want to be meaningfully employed, to have a home, to provide for the family, be it our children or our parents. These are important and certainly must be provided for. 
But how far should we go in pursuing our material goods and material goals? How much is enough? How do we avoid getting trapped in a vicious cycle of endless competition just to keep up with the Joneses or to get ahead of others? In the end, success is really for each one to define. There is no single measure of achievement. But the message we get from our engagements with Singaporeans is quite clear. Success is less about the pot of gold at the end of the road and more about our sense of purpose and fulfillment along the way. In other words, success, success is less about means and more about meaning. For example, we are used to celebrating those who move to the top of certain professions or cheering for those who launch startups and new enterprises. But we should equally embrace those who choose to spend more time with their families because they want to be better parents or caregivers. We should equally recognize those with talents in diverse areas. For example, those who excel in the arts and sports, those who serve in retail, hospitality or social services, or those who take great pride in their work as skilled tradesmen or artisanal craftsmen. Our refreshed Singapore story, therefore, must be more inclusive. It cannot be limited to a few selected pathways of advancement, with some pathways accorded higher status than others. We must value the success of every individual, each one pursuing his or her own path. And we must provide many more ways for our diverse talents to be the best possible versions of themselves, to make a difference in their own ways, all deserving of equal respect in our society. Now, this more inclusive approach towards success must also shape our thinking on education and skills. We have been making changes in our education system over the years. We've done away with PSLE T-scores. We are phasing out streaming, for example, just to name some changes. But we still, as a society, focus too much on who gets the best grades, who makes the cut for certain brand name schools, or which courses they qualify for. And not surprisingly, many students feel caught in a red race from a young age. It's not so easy to change these very entrenched mindsets. We recognize that every student, and perhaps more so their parents, will have their preferred schools. But if these preferences draw us unwittingly into an education arms race, we will all end up worse off as a society. And that's why I keep telling people it's okay. I keep telling people about my own experiences in the primary and secondary schools near my home. You may be tired of me saying this, but the point is, every child can be assured of a good education, whichever school they go to, as was my experience. I've benefited from this personally, and I'm determined to make sure every school in Singapore remains a good school. Another key mindset shift is to recognize that formal education early in life is not the end point of our meritocracy. Our refreshed meritocracy must be a continuous one with learning opportunities across multiple junctures of life. Everyone must have the chance to try again, do better, and move forward in life years after le leaving school. So success it's not about your grades or your academic qualifications. Success is about lifelong learning. Always learning, always improving, always doing better in school and beyond school. After all, the world of work today is no longer linear. It's not about a single employer, a single profession, or even a single skill set. It's about being comfortable with multiple roles which will themselves evolve over time. And that's why we are looking at major changes to strengthen skills future, to provide every Singaporean with many opportunities to reskill and upskill themselves. No one should be stuck at the highest formal educational level attained in their youth, and everyone should be able to update their skill sets, pivot to new careers, seize new opportunities, and keep moving forward in life. In short, a key part of our refreshed 
social compact is to make sure Singapore becomes a full-fledged learning society where every citizen is well-equipped and well-positioned to pursue their own version of the Singapore story. Second, we will also review and update our system of social support. Some countries talk about a cradle-to-grave welfare system. It's an attractive ideal to provide universal assurance for all citizens throughout their lives. But there are also age-old problems in realizing this ideal. Who pays for the system? How do we keep the system going as the population gets older? And how do we provide help without encouraging dependency and entitlement? And there are no easy answers, which is why in Singapore we have been careful in designing our social safety nets, whether it's in housing, education, healthcare, or retirement, and we want these to be effective in helping the vulnerable groups, but we do so in a way that boosts their sense of ownership and agency over their own circumstances. Nevertheless, as we enter a more volatile and unpredictable environment, we will do more to assure both the broad middle and the vulnerable that they can meet their needs in life and will not be left behind. In fact, I've touched on this on previous occasions, so instead of going through specific areas of policy reviews, let me just briefly outline some key areas we are currently looking at. One, support for the unemployed. How can we help them with their day-to-day -day needs while they go about their skills training and job search? to ensure they find a good match instead of simply accepting the first role that comes along the way. Second, support for lower-income families. How can we enable and empower them to move forward, uplift their wages, and especially to close the early gaps in their children's lives, making sure that the disadvantages do not multiply as the kids go to school? Third, how can we provide support for vulnerable groups, including persons with disabilities, as well as their family members and caregivers? And fourth, how should we provide more support for our seniors, not just for their health care needs, but also their longer-term care and living arrangements, and ultimately their retirement needs, so that we can all have peace of mind as we grow old? So these are areas of reviews which we are undertaking. And as we update and enhance our schemes and programs, we will ensure that whatever we do is also fiscally sustainable. But overall, it's likely that the government will have to spend more, focusing our resources on those with greatest needs. And it's right that we do so and enhance the assurances we give to every Singaporean that in this harsh, unpredictable world, we will always have your back. No one will fall by the wayside. We will support you so you can strive to achieve, do your best, and bounce back stronger should you encounter any setbacks in life. Third, we need a renewed sense of solidarity to underpin our refreshed compact. And this sense of solidarity means we need to be less about I, me, and mine, and more about we, us, and ours. In our system of meritocracy, we tend to reward and celebrate individual efforts and hard work, and that's appropriate. But if we take this too far, it can lead to the mistaken notion that our achievements are entirely our own efforts. And so some people may think if we succeed, it's on us. If we fail, it's also on us. So I'll be a self-made man or woman, and I don't need to owe anyone anything. Now, it's good to be self-reliant, and as a society, we do want to value and reward individual effort and hard work. But let's also be careful not to take this to an extreme, because in fact, no one succeeds alone. Every success story is a shared story. We all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, and if you look at anyone who realizes their dreams, there's always someone who motivated them, supported them, inspired them, and gave them confidence to move forward. So we do have to adjust our attitudes and mindsets about success in our meritocracy. Success is not I. Success is we. Success is not individual. Success is collective. 
and our social compact must build on this deep sense of kinship and trust in one another. Those who have succeeded must do their part to help uplift others in society. We must never be a society where people feel they are left to fend for themselves. Instead, we want every Singaporean to know and feel that they have a stake in our society and we all have a sense of obligation and responsibility toward one another. And in fact, we saw this, we experienced this during the last three years of the pandemic, how Singaporeans rallied together to support each other and how we upheld trust in our fellow citizens. And that was what enabled us to find our way through the pandemic. We should never take this for granted. Trust is precious. It takes time to build, but it can be lost very quickly, especially in a diverse society like ours, where dangers like communalism and racialism can never be fully eradicated. Just think of what happened during the height of the pandemic when we saw a sharp rise in racist incidents, uh, when people were starting to accuse one another falsely, and we saw racist incidents breaking out uh, in, in, in quite a short period of time. Since then, the situation has improved, the number of such incidents have come down. And surveys that we conduct, including external surveys, suggest that overall trust in Singapore remains high. But there's still scope for improvement at the local and the neighbourhood level. So we should continue to find ways to strengthen this sense of trust between Singaporeans, between people in Singapore. Our starting point must be that every community here, no matter how small, will always be valued and will always have a place. Because we want every group to celebrate their own cultures and traditions, as these are part of their roots and identity. At the same time, we encourage everyone to look beyond your own communities, to come together and to expand the common ground we share as Singaporeans. And we have to do this deliberately and purposefully to facilitate more intergroup interactions. Such interactions are deeply personal decisions. The government cannot force it to happen, and therefore there are no easy policy interventions. But we should certainly continue to find ways to strengthen our sense of community and human connections. And so we will see how we can do more to facilitate volunteering opportunities at the local level. For example, by empowering residents to participate in community building in their neighbourhoods and hopefully catalyse more ground-up initiatives. And we will continue to promote more social mixing amongst our young, be it through CCAs or other inter-school activities. Ultimately, our social compact is not forged by confrontation or coercion or asserting the rights of one group over another. Instead, it is built through regular interactions, through accommodation and compromise, and a spirit of mutual respect and fellowship. The Singapore way is not insular, it's not tribal. It is always open, inclusive, and big-hearted. So far, I've spoken about the changes that the government is thinking about to reshape, revisit our social compact. But policy shifts alone will not be enough. We must all do our part to bring about the changes we want to see in our society. For example, we can all take steps to engage and connect with our neighbours especially those from different ethnic groups, and to strengthen our kampong spirit. Employers can better value and reward their workers, ensure fair employment practices, invest in skills training for your workers and enable them to progress in their careers. Consumers can treat service and technical staff with dignity and respect, recognize the important work that our fellow citizens undertake and do our part to help uplift their wages. Parents can give their children more space to develop and discover their dreams and instill in our children the right values to learn and try out new things. Those of us who have benefited from society can give back through volunteerism and philanthropy by helping the less fortunate or mentoring and nurturing the next generation. 
and those who are passionate about issues can get involved in policy making, contribute your ideas, co-create new initiatives by participating in our citizens' panels or newly set up youth panels. We can all contribute in our own ways to refresh and update our social compact and build the Singapore we want for the future. So these are some of the ideas we are looking at for Forward Singapore. Forward Singapore is a bold agenda, and it depends on all of us to realize. Our refreshed social compact will be our compass for the road ahead. Though we will not see change overnight, we can each start to embrace this new compact today. And if we all do this, if we all do our part, we can be assured that we too will benefit when others feel a deep, deeper sense of responsibility towards us and towards our society. Then we can sustain, hopefully, a virtuous circle of uplift, progress and confidence, and we can strengthen our solidarity and trust as a nation. As a whole, our society will grow stronger and fairer, more just and united. And that's how we can keep the Singapore story going and we can continue to move forward together as one people. Thank you, and I look forward to the conversation with all of you later. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, DPM, for your opening remarks and where you talked about this uh, a renewed sense of solidarity amongst us, um, looking, uh, perhaps if I can borrow a phrase from an earlier panel, uh, looking to the left, but especially, uh, especially to the left, and not only just to the right of the distributions that we have uh, in, in society. Um, you also talked about this uh, virtuous circle of uplift, uh, creating and sustaining uh, these virtuous cycles or circles of uplift, progress and confidence that we need to build in each other. Um, th so thank you for that. Um, maybe I'll kick off the, um, this, this um, Q&A discussion um, and, and actually also intro um, our other panelists uh, by just investigating uh, how, what we might understand as uh, the social compact and, and really probe the word compact which has a few different meanings. In one sense, it could be taken as an action word, um, exerting a force on something, in this case a society, um, to make it more uh, neatly and tightly packed together, bound together. So that's the first sense. The other sense comes from the Latin word compactisis, um, which means to make an agreement or a covenant, right? So that's the arrangements that we have as a society that describe our relationships with each other. How do we do this? This is oftentimes in laws, institutions, policies, but also our norms. Um, and, and, and these dictate, govern, drive our relationships with each other, uh, whether, again, we are looking to the right or to the left, uh, of these distributions, um, and uh, really um, the distributions uh, in the economic context, but also um, in the racial, cultural, political, uh, and uh, identity, gender and sexuality identity uh, context that uh, we've been talking about today. Uh, we have two respondents, uh, Associate Professor uh, Ho Kong Wing, uh, who is uh, labor economist at SMU who works on social mobility. Uh, and we have uh, Dr. Gok Sun Ju, uh, who is the chief skills officer uh, at uh, Skills Future Singapore. Um, and uh, Kong Weng will have some remarks, uh, followed by Sun Ju, uh, and then we'll have an open discussion later on. Uh, I'm Ho Kong Weng from Singapore Management University. I'm privileged to be here and also hear the speech of DPM. So learn much from that. Uh, so the title, the subtitle of my presentation is Well-being of Youth. So I'm using this lens on youth to understand the social compact. Why the youth? Because I have worked on youth data uh, based on the National Youth Survey. So I want to present something that I'm familiar with. Okay, 
the social compact, what are the uh, various considerations that we want to look at, I will share with you very soon. I do not have a Latin definition of social compact. Uh, so I just use uh, what is uh, more practical. Uh, broadly speaking, a social compact is a shared understanding of how all of us in society relate to one another. It is about the respective roles and responsibilities of different groups. I hope you remember this definition. Uh, it is also um, giving different members of the society opportunity to do well and to bond together. Okay? So the references are listed there. So may I go on to the next? So therefore, I have some suggestion. Uh, number one, uh, some consideration that, that I suggest for you to ponder over includes the number one, uh, implicit contract. The social compact is an implicit contract because uh, you, you cannot write down uh, an explicit contract uh, across different groups, different income groups, racial groups, gender, Singaporean PRs or foreigners working and living in Singapore, or even age group. But it's also important to allow everybody living and, and uh, working in Singapore to have a role to play to strengthen this social compact, especially across generations. And, and we have to remember the government is also an important member of the society. Next, we have to decide what is the common goal or what are the common goals and have, have it to be very transparent, attainable, without barriers and discrimination. Uh, we used to, well, that's in my opinion, we used to think that income or GDP is the only goal, but not necessarily true. So income is important, but there are other indicators that are good uh, to use to judge the performance of uh, an economy society, such as happiness, life satisfaction, relationships, etc. So relationship stocks such as family, capital, community, or na national stock are very important too. I will show you a little bit more later on. Uh, inequality or income inequality correlates with many social problems. Therefore, we have to monitor that, not just GDP itself. And social mobility, both intra- and intergenerational social mobility uh, will be important. Uh, it gives the youth especially a sense of moving up, the opportunity, a dream, a hope. Uh, Government and inclusive institution, uh, for example, legal institution, economic institution, cultural institution, they critically set and facilitate the common goals. So I think that is very important. Um, so we need to develop inclusive institution. Lastly, meritocracy, fairness and efficiency, we need to balance that them well. Uh, it's a common concept in economics. When you have more equity, you may have to have lower efficiency, but not necessarily true. Okay? Uh, so this, this balancing act would be related to the evolving social preference and even individual desire to sacrifice for the common good. Okay. Next, I will use my uh, finding using the National Youth Survey data to look at the alternative, not just income. So I introduce these three relationship stocks, be it related to the family, to the community, or to the nation. Uh, uh, you, you could have the PPT later on, huh? so I, I will just go on. So these are three important relationship stocks, not just money, relationship matters much. So I do well-being regression with the relationship stocks. Uh, so well-being is defined to be either happiness or life satisfaction reported by the views. What I found is that family capital 
contribute positively to the well-being of the youths. Social participation of the youths in various social groups contributed positively too. However, leadership index contributed negatively. Why? Because they had to make sacrifices. There's a price to pay. Hence, we found it is negative. The national capital stock is positive. Next, I want to share with you the uh, life goals of the youths. It could be non-zero-sum life goals, such as family-oriented life goals or altruism-oriented life goals. Zero-sum life goals are career-oriented life goals. Guess which life goals would have a positive impact on the well-being of the youth? Many youths are very career-oriented. However, we found that career-oriented life goals would have a negative impact on the well-being of the youths, not just using Singapore data, but also using the German data consistently. Germany has panel data more comprehensive than the Singapore data. It is robust finding. Family-oriented life goals, altruism-oriented oriented life goals that contribute towards the social compact contribute positively to the well-being of the youth. Well, we want to look at uh, income as well because income may correlate with many uh, other indicators that are non-economic. Income inequality has a negative impact on child well-being, or has a positive impact on obesity, drug abuse, risk of imprisonment, homicide rates, etc. So we know that we have to deal with income inequality carefully. So look at this chart. This chart is a little bit dated. It is an S-shaped curve, telling us that the lower income group have an income growth rate lower than the upper income group, for sure inequality will increase. That was past data. How about recent data? The S-shaped curve has changed. That, that is good news for us. Okay? So you do see that the lower income group now has higher income growth rate than the upper income group. And that's why we see that the Gini coefficient has been going down for the past decade and more. Okay. So I want to look at the social mobility, income mobility. So we, we noted that income inequality is a snapshot of the distribution, but over time, the underlying current is actually intergeneration transmission of economic and non-economic uh, advantages. Uh, so what we see here, using this quantile regression, we uh, do see that the broad middle income group of youths, they have high social mobility or less dependence on parental background. However, a caution is that at the upper end, at the lower end, the dependence on parental background is much more. How about using a, a transition matrix? We do see that we have high mobility. Huh? Okay, let, let me keep going. Uh, so next, I want to do uh, well-being regression on perceived opportunity. So what we do see here is that career opportunity contributed significantly and positively to the well-being of the youth. Uh, work connection is actually the reverse coded of perceived meritocracy. So it seems like it is not significant, right? It has no relationship. But when I do further analysis, there is, uh, let me share with you the result. Career opportunities are important. Inequality as an incentive is also cost positively correlated to the well-being of the youth. In other words, it may suggest that income inequality in Singapore is not too far off from the, the optimal level. Okay? Uh, work connection is the opposite of perceived meritocracy. Perceived social mobility matters much in subjective well-being, especially for the poor. So have you remembered that? How about for the rich? For the rich, the contribution of perceived social mobility uh, is dampened, but when inequality incentive is high, meaning that connection and luck may become more important for the uh, uh, upper half of the youth. 
Okay, how about the middle income group? We do see earlier that the uh, broad middle income group of the youth enjoy high level of social mobility, and we have to maintain that and put in effort in sustaining that. Future research should explore the mobility barriers faced at the lower tail and the upper tail. So that's my presentation. In conclusion, uh, it is important to look at the social compact at the either end, but the middle income group, we should not forget about them. Thank you. Thanks, Gong Wing. Thanks for introducing this idea of, of relationship stocks in your uh, terminology, but perhaps uh, we can reframe that as, as capital as well. Um, thank you. Uh, Sun Chu. Thank, uh, thanks, Chris. Um, I would like to respond to DPM's call to review the, the approach to success and skills in Singapore. So, you know, I'm from SkillFuture Singapore, and among the audience and many of my partners here. So, SkillFuture initiative involves multiple stakeholders, tripartite partners, and more. It's, it's a means to support individuals to continually attaining career uh, aspirations throughout their life stages, through upskillings and reskilling. And of course, it's also to support enterprises to have skilled workforce to achieve their business goals. So since the launch of SkillFuture in 2015, many partners have come forth to build our skill ecosystem. Of course, more, more can be done. I can talk about it later on. But I think first part, I just want to very quickly give you a very brief update on what was our focus over the last seven years? It very simply, we can summarize to, we're trying very hard to enhance the access to lifelong learning, access to reskilling, and by reducing five barriers. So one is to reduce financial barriers, affordability, the issues. So future credit, all of us 25 years and above, we, we know we got future credit, and cost fee subsidies up to 90%, and Singaporean 40 to 60 years old, we have um, additional support for them. Reducing information barriers, the second one. How do you make informed decisions about what skills, which, pro, uh, which course, or what uh, career I can go into that uh, that they will attain the, the kind of career aspirations. So in 20, um, over, the t over the years, we work with uh, industry bodies, uh, sector agencies to look into industry transformation map, jobs uh, transformation map, to identify the kind of skills we needed for the economy, for the industry, and for the job roles. So this kind of job skills inside are pushed to the industry, to, to individuals. We also provide one-on-one one -on -one skill advisory services to complement the online, uh, two online portals. We have the Skill Future Portal and My Career Future Portal. So it's the number two there is to reduce information barriers. Thirdly, is to reduce learning barriers. How can learning be more effective? And we focus a lot on building workplaces to be learning uh, have the learning capability to have learning at work. So through our NACE uh, network system, we try to build work more, work more in workplaces. Two, we invest a lot in professionalizing our adult educators so that they know how to manage and design better learning for different age groups, different, uh, different industry needs, different job roles. And of course, the deployment of education, learn tech, learning anal analytics to help learners and invest in uh, learning innovation and research. Very important. How adults can learn better, neuroplasticity. These are very important. Fourth, we also trying to reduce application barrier. If I learn something, can I go back to workplace to apply? So we focus a lot working with IHL on skills-based learning design, a curriculum that facilitates applications, direct applications, and modularize learning for ease of acquisition and application. Lastly, is to reduce situational barrier. No time to learn because of work or family commitments. So at a, at a supply side, we look at how to make learning flexible, have learning modality online or in-person, stackable modules, and also the scheduling of learning sessions can be during work, outside of work, over the weekend. So these are the things that we've been doing over the last uh, seven years, um, which is to really to enhance the accessibility to learning, uh, the lifelong learning, and also to, to make it flexible. But we don't have a perfect solution, I must say. But as a Singapore and Singaporean, we, we have the resolve to continue to enhance the whole skill ecosystem. So part two, I want to very quickly cover then where are the opportunities for us to come together to really make Skill Future as a collective for all of us. It is not just funding and not just about training courses. 
So number one is by helping others in transitions because you will see that as the economic uh, transform, we will need to change the job content. New, skill, new skills will be needed, and people will be changing from new job and one job to another, or content are changing. So how can we help each other to learn new skills? This will require very supportive workplaces. Similarly, even so as, a, as a supervisor, mentor, at workplace, create opportunity for them to learn and apply and practice, and allow them time to, 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 to pick up the new skills. And supportive members, as family members as well, give them assurance and support. I think this is quite important and something I thought quite easy for us to do together. Number two is about community stepping forward to overcome access issues, new network, professional body, professional groups, business community coming together. And I'd like to cite two examples. One first is, I think in Singapore, our culinary community very, very, um, has been very strong, uh, have a strong tradition to support younger generation of aspiring chefs. They're coming together, especially coming together to every year participate in culinary Olympic globally. After their busy work schedule, after work, they come together. Why? Because they believe that by honing the culinary skill is so important to nurture the aspiration of younger chef. And this is something that I think we should celebrate. And then of course, they won many awards globally. Second, second example on the side are really grown up. People who understand they have passions to want to share expertise and know-how to promote a cause. For example, Repair Kopiti, I mean, some of us may know, they want to promote repair and reuse, not to throw away home appliances. So they come out with simple training programs for people to come together to learn how to repair home appliances and then let them go back to their neighborhood to set up their own repair Kopitiam. And this, again, is a ground-up initiative. No funding needed, but they really promote a cause. So I think the community must come together to do uh, overcome access issue. Thirdly, for business and, and trade association and chambers to come together to support SME is very important because SME does not have the kind of resources as a large company have. So we have started some Queen Bee initiative to get large enterprises to support the value chain of small enterprises coming together. A uh, most recent one we just announced is ST Logistics. They stepped forward to help the logistics sector, SME, to look into training them in cybersecurity, workplace safety and health, and these are really encouraging. The other example is Singapore Sustainability Alliance. The Sustainability Energy As uh, Association of Singapore come together with Singapore's Chinese Chamber of Commerce and SG Tech to say that, hey, we need to come together to help the small medium enterprises to know how to adopt uh, sustainability practices in their business. So they, they know that some may be digital solutions, some may be business solutions, so they come together to support that. So I thought these are something very important for us to make Skill Future a collective. Yeah, so my, my in sum is, the new approach to skill and success will need all the stakeholders. So skill future is more than just funding and program. It is about all of us collectively coming together to support one another. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, again, a sense of that solidarity, that responsibility to each other, to uplift each other. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we'll now open the floor to questions. Uh, but um, uh, in the interest of time, what I would do is ask everybody in this room uh, to queue up your questions uh, so that we can deal with them uh, as appropriate, um, so that the panel can deal with them as appropriate. Um, uh, I will also do the same uh, with the help of my team back there um, to also uh, sort of synchronize some of the online questions that are coming through, and there are many. Um, so, but if you will just give me uh, the moderator's privilege of asking the first question. And it has similar uh, sort of uh, connections with some of the online questions that have already started to come in. And, and it's this idea of the definition of success uh, and uh, what it is, uh, what it means uh, to not succeed, uh, that is, to fail. And uh, how do we, as a society, um, you know, ensure that we generate those circles of uplifting uh, from failure uh, to and then change that into uh, progress uh, and, and success ultimately as well. Um, so maybe if 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 could ask um, you know uh, DPM and then also um, uh, Sunju and, and, and Kong Wang, whether um, you know how do you think about us uh, as our society thinking about this idea of non-success or failure? 
Well, Chris, I, I think it's really, you know, a lot of the things we've talked about just now, uh, about embracing that broader sense of success. And that broader sense of success, not just in terms of specific professions or jobs, but thinking about success as a journey that all of us go through. And in that journey, there will be ups and downs, there will be setbacks, there will be obstacles. But along the way, we keep learning, we keep improving. And if we can embrace that as a society and support one another along the way, I think that hopefully will really provide a more inclusive approach towards thinking about success. If you think about different job roles, some of that has already changed. Sun Ju talks about culinary. Mm -hmm. uh, 20, 30 years ago, it was very different. If a pa you know, parents have a children that say, I want to be a chef, you know what the reaction will be uh, from the parents. Today, it's slightly different. Uh, but not, it has not applied to different kinds of profession. I mean, if your child comes up to you and says, I want to start a car mechanic workshop, you have a different view. So, you know, some things have changed, some things have not, and we can still do better. Um, and, and we're talking here about different roles, but really, we should also start to realize that for all of us, we will have multiple roles in our lifetime. It's no longer just one career. We may do a corporate job one time. We may move on to do a more flexible work uh, another time. We may at some point in time decide, I want to stop work. I want to be a better father, mother. I want to be a caregiver to my parents. We will have evolving roles. And as a society, we should embrace all of these different roles and support one another in the process. Thank you. Yeah. Keep you. I, I, I would say that um, um, today, more, more of us have the chance to play different roles. Whether we are mentor, we are coaches like myself, uh, as a volunteer career coach, I think the, some, the success is when we help someone to help themselves make sense of what they want to do next. So it's not always chasing that price of who is going to win, but knowing someone else, it, benefit from that one hour of conversation. I think that journey is equally important. And I do see that today, perhaps maybe it's not surface enough. There are many people doing different things like Vera who started the, the repair Gobidium. I don't think at the, there's, been, there's no money involved. It's about that belief that we want to help people to repair and reuse. So that missions and there's a, there's a spread and build out of the network of people believe in that, that cause and willing to do so. So I, I, I think there are many ways to do that is, and not looking at just purely the price, as I mentioned, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, there's a difference between individual success mm. and social success. So to the individual, they may have different idea what is being successful, but for the society, it is important to help those who are maybe left behind or struggle or undergoing a spiral downturn. So that is important to help them to move up, to help them to have the dream for the future, especially for the next generation. So focus on the children too. So that the, the upward mobility is important, not necessarily relative mobility. Upward mobility in various aspects. For example, whether they feel satisfied with their life. It's an alternative indicator uh, to GDP. Thank you. And there's that shared responsibility to contribute to that. Uh, yes, shared to role. help. So when you help other people, this is uh, altruism-oriented life goals. So you, you gain happiness from that too. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I see one question from the floor. Uh, if you could introduce yourself, and um, maybe there could be others as well um, in the queue. Thank you. All right, I am Piyush Gupta from DBS Bank. Um, you know, I think I want to stick to this question of how do you define success. Uh, one of my favorite books is a book by a Dutch uh, philosopher scientist, uh, Albert Hirschman, who wrote in the 1970s. And he basically makes the case that the organizing principle of society till the 16th century uh, was passions, like warfare, conquest, and so on. And society consciously took 200 years to evolve to a guiding principle of material success and profit maximization. Mm -hmm. Uh, people like Adam Smith, uh, Locke, Rousseau, um, all of the big scientists over 200 years figured that a society which is organized around individual uh, focus on personal well-being 
creates much better outcomes. Less war, less bloodshed, less conquest, and better material outcomes. Uh, it took 200 years. So as we think about reorganizing society and redefining the value of, I mean, the definition of success away from material success to the kinds of things DPM you talked about, uh, it strikes me as not such an easy thing to do. And especially in today's world, where you have social media, you have internet, everybody's seeing Insta, you're seeing what the people are posting on Facebook, your definition of who's successful is created by this virtual world. So how do you suggest we actually make this thing happen in a concentrated time frame, which is achievable uh, and doesn't take us 200 years to get <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Mr. Gupta. Um, again, you know, a lot of commonality with some of the online questions. Uh, Darren Ho put in a question that is very similar. Also, uh, Prof Tanan sir uh, has, has talked about this idea of, of you know, success, uh, your point about uh, success being a higher order purpose, uh, but, but what about the other aspects of it? Um, so how can we ensure uh, that, that Singaporeans can crowd in uh, to deliver all these outcomes? No, I don't have the answers. I, <laughs> I, I mean, if no one can claim to have the answer and we have to be realistic, I think basic needs are still important. The point that Prof Ho mentioned just now, I think income is still going to be important. And one of the challenges we will have to address as part of this broader definition of success is to think how we can compress our wage structure in society so that the wage gaps are not so wide. So it really ought not to matter too much, right? If you aspire towards something that you are good at with your hands, you want to do a, a job in the services sector, then you should get paid fairly and decently. Uh, but beyond a certain point, hopefully, it's not about chasing after that extra dollar. I mean, you need some basic wages to have a home, and some of these basic assurances ought to remain, and some of that responsibility also ought to be provided by the government in housing, in education, and we are going to do more with regards to lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. So beyond basic assurances, beyond decent fair wages, hopefully beyond that, um, there will be uh, at least a, a sense of people being more uh, open-minded mm -hmm. about different pathways. Because a lot of that mindsets today are also, I think, um, status conscious, very hierarchical, mm. right? We, even if within a bank, some jobs are more prestigious than other jobs. Mm. You may not want to admit it, <laughs> but the culture is like that. Within an organization, it is so. And how do we start to shift that kind of mindset? Not so easy to do, but I think corporate leaders can help, business leaders can help, community leaders can help, and we should all try and move in that direction. Uh, and hopefully, if we make that effort, uh, you know, things can shift not 200 years, but uh, certainly not overnight either. But at least we are continuing to make progress in the right direction. And to the point that Prof Ho said just now, very importantly, there will be some who, do not, who, who struggle. Even within this broad framework, there will be some who struggle. There will be some who meet genuine setbacks in life real obstacles and they really struggle and we it's really uh, you know for us as a society how do we provide that social safety net to take care of them that 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 ability to help them bounce back quickly um, from setbacks and particularly to make sure that the disadvantages do not magnify for their children and their children have all the uh, support they need to really uh, have a good start in life so that's those would be the things that we focus on um, Kongwen, uh, you know, and maybe a touch on this idea of, that you had of family capital and that being quite an important uh, sort of driver, right, of, of um, some of the, uh, you know, kind of attributes that you talked about. Yeah, if you have a happy, happy family, you will be working productively at work. Okay. Otherwise, uh, that, that's the foundation of the society. Yeah. Yeah. I, like, I like Prof Ho's... Uh, you know, all his surveys just now shows no? family relationships a plus for individual well-being. Social participation a plus for individual well-being. Unfortunately, community leadership was a minus yeah. for individual <laughs> well-being. Hopefully temporarily. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> you know, then, but, but we want people to take on leadership positions in the community too, and to serve. And yes, it is a bit of a sacrifice, but hopefully that sense of fulfillment, that sense of service to others will outweigh the sac personal sacrifice. Yes, uh, another question over there. Good afternoon. I'm Liu Zi from Singapore Poly. And I have a question for social comeback as a whole, which is over the year we have witnessed the general integration of AI system, such as chat, GTPT, and mid-journey, and other systems that are way more than just an informational system that can be implemented into a lot of the actual factual, like the fields. So. I pose a question that how can we strike a balance between the harnessing the benefits of AI and ensuring inclusive and fairness in its implementation? And how can we leverage AI to empower individuals, enhancing social mobility and bridge any existing gaps within our society to aim for the success that we have been talking about? Additional to that, our, as we consider the ethical implication of AI, we bring back to our social compact, which is mostly about the the connection between the government and the people. So how does the AI, can we ensure its transparency, accountability, and privacy protection to maintain the trust between the government and the people as AI is slowly being implemented to our, um, like all of the technology and also the website such as the one we have been mentioned before. So how can we address concern of job displacement and real reskilling, ensuring that our workforce remain adaptable and future ready? It is a huge question on the <laughs> impact of uh, technology and the potential disruption. Um, one part of it is about responsible usage of AI, ethics and privacy and all, all, all these guardrails that are necessary. That's a broader conversation that will certainly need to take place. We are embarking on it, not just ourselves, but also with countries you know, worldwide. But there is another aspect of this, which is about the impact on jobs, mm -hmm. whether it is AI or other forms of technology, and the risk of or the likelihood that this will disrupt current roles in the workplace. I think this will certainly happen. I do not think that we will end up in a dystopian future where it's all about machines and humans become obsolete. It has never been the case. That each new wave of technology will create that kind of a fear. But if you look throughout human history, while technology may make certain roles obsolete, it will also create new roles. And so it's really about helping humans adapt, helping workers adapt to these new technologies. So from the government's point of view, our biggest challenge is not to stop technology. We have to embrace technology, but how to help workers adapt to new technologies, reskill, upskill in a continuous basis, recognizing that the impact of disruption with AI may be even bigger than anything we have faced in the past. And hence, we talked about skills future, and I mentioned just now why we think skills future, a strengthened skills future system will be such an important part of our new compact going forward. And we are now reviewing what are the different ways we can, what different measures we can take to reduce barriers to learning, not just going beyond providing credits and having courses available. What are the different kinds of barriers that hinder individuals from reskilling and upskilling themselves, as Sunju had shared just now? And how can we go about systematically reducing these barriers? and building a culture of lifelong learning. Yeah. I just want to quickly respond to the questions because we have been looking at this issue for quite a while. And it is not about pitching technology or AI against human. Actually, behind all the technology and AI are human. They are the ones who create the next things that make things, to me, make things better. Um, for example, generative AI, if you look at it, they they actually improve productivity a lot, a lot. When I talk to artists, a creative industry, a lot of them are using it to spar idea of, okay, give me some quick idea so that they can present things to their, to their clients. People are doing kind of more extensive research that they can do an iterative process. So I think the, the potential is quite, 
quite, quite um, exciting. Um, it will likely remove or reduce or change tasks within job role, but highly unlikely to totally remove job roles. I think we can see that through history, gen, uh, industry revolution, IRA 1, 2, 3, it's very seldom that totally a job role are disappearing. So I think it's how we, how we get our, our workforce to learn how to use the machines or use the AI to do our work well. I think that's quite important. Very quickly, they will ride on the, on the bandwagon and then use it to help out do our work. I think that's more important. Um, technological progress uh, can be skilled biased in the past. It could replace workers too. So therefore, I suggest we should have a directed uh, technological change or progress. The three entities, government, the labor union, and TUC, and also the, the employers or even the researcher should come together to innovate, to innovate so that the productivity of the workers can be enhanced, benefiting the middle group too, not just to the innovators. So to have more directed, SMO group has some uh, uh, papers on that. Um, so yes. that's my suggestion. So, so just like what uh, Prof. Ho say, in, in fact, in Singapore, if you look at our ITM, our JTM, okay, our industry transformation map, our job, job transformation map, it has clearly identified where the automation can take place. How can workforce change accordingly because of these needs? So I think we are trying to make it as explicit as possible so I can direct individuals to say, and, and companies to say where can training take place and where are the reskilling is possible. I think that's where the the collective can come together to make it happen instead of fear, fearing the change. But to embrace it and say, okay, I'm going to work with machine, I'm going to manage this, I'm going to command it so that I can do the work better. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and I think uh, maybe what uh, DPM said about earlier about um, you know, kind of the government's role uh, syncs quite nicely with one of the questions that come in online, uh, which asks about the role of the government in the new um, revisited, reframed uh, social compact. Um, you know, th there's this idea that, um, you know, Singapore has been uh, labeled as a nanny state uh, and that, um, you know, kind of, um, that, that, that kind of provides and protects for better or for worse. Um, you know, how will and should this change going forward? I think you gave an example already, uh, but, but, you know, are, are there any other examples of this? Yep. I, I mentioned just now in my remarks quite a number of areas that we are looking at whether it's unemployment support, uplifting wages for the lower income, making sure that their children get a good start in life, taking care of vulnerable groups, uh, helping our seniors. So, I mean, there's quite a number of things we are looking at. Um, it's, it, it entails more government spending, more government resources, and across all of these areas, we have to think hard about how much more to spend, how do we design policies in a way that's effective and also fiscally sustainable. Th this is not about nanny becoming even bigger nanny. I mean, this is about how, from the government's point of view, we provide a framework of assurances for Singaporeans amidst greater uncertainties and volatility, more opportunities for everyone to realize their Singapore dream or the Singapore story, and ultimately make sure that we keep Singapore as a high trust society where we maintain that sense of solidarity and trust with one another. Because if trust is lost, if, or if we run empty on trust, you know, all hope is lost. And we really need to make sure that sense of trust remains for us to take Singapore forward in a very un uncertain and challenging world. Thank you, Dupiam. I recognize there's a question from there. Um, if there are any other questions from the floor, another one there, maybe we'll take those two uh, and then um, uh, look to end and wrap up so shortly. Please. Really uh, more a comment. I'm Stephanie Yuan Tio, chairman of SHE. Um, DPM, I think what you've talked about today is uh, quite earth shaking in the sense that Singapore has very much been a nanny state. The social compact with the, with the people has been don't complain too much. 
uh, we will make sure you have jobs and you have housing. Um, you, if you buy an HDB, there will be value creation for your family. You can leave that to your family as the nest egg. Um, if you study hard, you will do well in, in school and you will do well in life. I, I think we are coming to recognize that we no longer have the ability to deliver on a nanny state promise, nor should we want to. I think today's conversation, whether it's on the definition of what's a new enhanced meritocracy, what is pluralism, and pluralism is not just about inclusiveness of gender or race, but of ideas and more importantly of values. I think the conversation then needs to really move to that bigger, more utopian vision. What is the Singapore that we want to see for ourselves? And that's when the conversation about what is success um, why does contribution matter? Mm -hmm. Why does what is the social and family capital, why is that important? Mm -hmm. um, I think that the conversation really needs to move to that bigger plane. It's not just about new policies, it's not just about new social safety nets, how much the government is going to subsidize. It's really about the new Singapore that we want and what does each person have to do and what's the government's role in that? Okay. Thank you. Thank I you. fully agree with what uh, Stephanie said just now in terms of having that broader conversation about what our Singapore story means. Mm, I, I, would, I would say it's not because we can't deliver on the basics, just to be clear, right? Just to be clear. Good education remains important. Housing, affordable, accessible for every Singaporean continues to be the case. All that we have promised and, and, and said we, you know, our, what our parents have, what our children have, we can continue to deliver on that. But what needs to change, what needs to change is, must our version of that Singapore dream always be about chasing after positional good mm -hmm. relative to one another? And if we keep on pushing in that direction, my house must be bigger than your house. My paycheck must be bigger than your paycheck. My status in life must be higher than your status in life. Are we going to be happier? I seriously doubt so. I seriously doubt so. I think we, if we move in that direction, we are just going to be caught in a red race, in an arms race, and everyone will be worse off. So this is not about not being able to deliver on housing and all those other good things. We will continue to do all of that. But Let's also reflect on beyond a certain point. What, what do we want for ourselves, for our children? For, and, and I think Prof. Ho made a good point about the importance of other things, relationships, families, participation in communities, social connectedness, our human connectedness. These things are important too. They are not captured in our GDP, but they are equally, if not more, important. So we want to have a good economy. We want to have good jobs for everyone. We want to have housing available. Uh, those we want to have, but we want to go beyond that to really be a city where the human spirit thrives. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, I, we have one last question uh, down there, and in the interest of time, maybe uh, we can listen to that question uh, and then maybe uh, also wrap up. Yep, thank you. Please. Good afternoon, DPM Wong and panelists. Um, my, uh, my question will focus on the social compact. Um, this phrase has surfaced a lot recently in our discussions. Um, how would you sell the idea of roles and responsibilities to our fast aging population? And what would be the roles and responsibility of this very important and um, uh, this segment of population that is increasing in number? Um, is it is it a process of self-discovery and organic realization of our roles and responsibility? Or is there perhaps, um, I'm, I'm a Singaporean, um, perhaps for, for our lack of social awareness um, and to strengthen our social awareness, is there a specific set of contribution you hope to see from the older adult population in Singapore? I think there will be contributions from all segments of society. It's not just from the older groups. Um, we think that, I mean, there's scope for employers to do things differently. 
uh, with, with, I mentioned just now the importance of employers having fair employment practices, investing more in workers, taking HR seriously, taking training seriously. I think there's a lot more we can do in, on that front. And that's certainly part of the new compact that we hope to achieve. Uh, I think there's more, a lot more that individuals can do to not only contribute to their own personal aspirations, but to help others, right? Volunteering, philanthropy, nurturing the next generation, mentoring, and we will continue to provide opportunities for all of that. Uh, and uh, for our seniors, it's, it's different because they are at a different phase of life. They have already contributed so much. Really, it's for us to take care of them. Mm. Uh, and, and we'll have to think about how best to do so, recognizing that our population is aging rapidly. Uh, and it's not just a matter of the, you know, making sure healthcare is more affordable. That is one aspect of it. Increasingly, we are thinking harder and harder about what sort of long-term arrangements do we put in place? Care for seniors, how do we make sure that they can have peace of mind as they grow older? Um, how do we take care of their retirement needs? So these are things that we are, you know, issues that I, I'm sure Singaporeans do care, serious, uh, care deeply about, and we are looking at all of them. Yeah. Thanks, Deepin. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can end off uh, uh, with a question from um, Michael Oshana from UWC, uh, and he asks, um, there's been a lot spoken of the government's role in the revisited social com contract or compact but what about the role of the people? What incentives do more successful people have to uplift those around them? How else can we convince them to enrich and give back to their communities apart from working for the greater good? Yeah. So maybe uh, you know, Sun Ju yeah. first and then uh, Gong Wing and then maybe DPM. Yeah, I, I, I would say that I'll go back to, to what I mentioned earlier when I respond to DPM's uh, address is yeah, just come forth and contribute in, in Skill Future Collective. There's so much thing we can do together, either in, uh, individual as a mentor, as a coach, or the workplace, or just turn around and help somebody who, who are going through the transitions, who need help, or helping in other businesses. So I think there's a lot of that. And, and from the business angle, there's a lot of benefits for a large company to help a small company because you just add up to and in, in enhancing the productivity. So there's a I, I don't think there's lack of incentive to do so. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, one possible way is through tax and uh, subsidy, taxes and subsidy, uh, or CSR, or letting the, uh, the various organizations to have more interaction with the workers, with different groups, and that, that would be helpful. Yep, thank you. DPM? Yeah, I thought we wanted the government to do less. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Therefore, the role but of the Why do we keep people. coming back to <laughs> government incentives and taxes and subsidies? Yeah. We can always talk about more taxes, <laughs> if you are keen. Um, we need more revenues. And then, of course, when we have more revenues, we will think hard about how we can channel these revenues, allocate them to areas where there are greater societal needs. That's the role of the government. I mean, we continually look at how we can make sure our fiscal system is sustainable, get the revenues we need, but have a very progressive system so that the revenues that we generate, largely from the higher income groups, the wealthier groups, are allocated to those with greater needs. And, and today, we already have a very progressive system. We will continue to do review and see how we can make the system fairer, more progressive. Uh, but I hope beyond government nudges, those who are well-to-do, those who have succeeded from the system, in fact, everyone in Singapore ought to feel that sense of, um, you know, success is not just about the individual. And that's what I, I spend some time trying to highlight. How can we change our whole attitude about success? We have become very used to a, a narrative of self-reliance and individual success. And, and don't get me wrong, I think it's good that we are self-reliant. I think it's good that we indiv re reward individual effort. But the reality is that success is never an individual pursuit. Success is always collective. Success is always about a shared story. And if we understand that deep in our hearts, then really 
all of us should make the effort, regardless of tax incentives and subsidies, to contribute something, to help the people around us, uh, volunteer our time, our monies, our efforts to uplift others and, and give back to the community. And if we all have that mindset, I think it will go a long way in really strengthening our social compact. Thank you, DPM. Uh, that's our stake in society, and that's what we all share together. Thank you, uh, panel. Thank you, Good Sunju. Thank you, Kong Wang. Thank you, DPM, uh, for sharing this time, and thank you all uh, for this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, DPM. It remains for me to thank the organizers, the research fellows who conceptualized uh, this program, JJ, Harry, Keiki, and Robin. And of course, my incomparable admin colleagues led by Si Ling and Zahida, who put all this together, and Hansen, who persuaded the sponsors um, that listed on the back screen. And of course, thanks to the sponsors. Uh, the 30th anniversary conference was called Diversities. This is revisiting. So good news knows what we will do on the 40th. Um, but thank you uh, for attending this and for being such a good audience. Good night. <laughs>